Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Pine Grove campus of Spry Church. We are glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. Special welcome to any guests we have with us, and welcome to those watching online as well. Uh, here at Spry Church, our mission is to love Jesus, it's to be transformed, and to declare hope. And so everything we do here at Spry is about following Jesus on that mission together. Uh, as we begin, just a, uh, two quick announcements and things to just talk about. So first of all, we want to say thank you to everybody who was able to make it to the Pentecost picnic last Sunday. Uh, to Kingdom Come, as we called it. It was a really, really great day. Uh, we started with worship. We had a set of baptisms and reaffirmations of faith. We had a whole uh, crew of people who joined the church as well. And so uh, it was a really just exciting day to mark and say thank you to God for all that he has done uh, in the life of our church over the last year. From there, we uh, just ha hung out, ate good food, played on the playground. It was a really wonderful day. The weather was beautiful. Um, and so if you had a part in that, setting up, tearing down, if you brought food, we thank you. Uh, we're grateful. And uh, we invite you to please put it on your calendar for next Pentecost. We will plan to do it again. Next year, it's June 6th, so it's a little bit later than this year. But we'll look forward uh, to getting together again as a church family, celebrating the church's birthday at uh, Kingdom Come next year. But thank you so much for everybody who participated last weekend. It was a lot of fun. Uh, the only other announcement this morning that we want to lift up quickly um, is that tomorrow is Memorial Day. And so Memorial Day is a day when we pause and say thank you uh, to a number of people, um, those who actively served in the military, uh, the families of those who served, and especially those who laid down their own lives uh, for the cause of freedom and to preserve the freedoms that we so um, generously enjoy here in our country. So if that applies to you, if you're someone who's served, if you have a family member who has served, we thank you. Um, and we just take a moment to give thanks to God for uh, being in a country where we can gather to do this openly. This is not the case in a lot of places around the world. A lot of Christians have to fight and claw for this right, uh, have to hide underground uh, to gather together to worship as God's people. Um, but because of those who have come before us who have served, they've preserved rights like this one for our church family to gather and to worship. So we are grateful uh, to them and grateful to all of you who have had a part in that story. And we just invite you to reflect on that this Memorial Day weekend. As you're eating your cheeseburger, as you're hanging out with family and friends tomorrow, as you're getting a day off work, um, reflect on the people who have earned that right for you. So I'm going to invite us to stand as we begin our time of worship this morning. Uh, we've gathered here to lift our praise and celebration uh, to God. And so I'm going to pray for us and hopefully uh, set the stage and set the tone for our time ahead. And just invite God to go to work here. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for who you are. We give you thanks for what you have done for us. For as we celebrate um, a very particular kind of freedom here on this Memorial Day weekend, we recognize the true and better freedom that you have offered to each of us. For you came, lived, died, and rose again so that we might have freedom from sin and death and so that we might have a right relationship with you. And so allow us, Lord, as we gather here this morning to just celebrate that for all it has meant for our lives, for all it will mean in the future, and for all it will mean for all of eternity, Lord, for you have secured for us a good, bright, and beautiful hope that we can carry with us all of our days and that will last forever and ever. And so, Lord, help us in the time ahead to just pour out our worship to you, celebrate you for who you are in the power of your Holy Spirit. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. One, two, three, four. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you you called my name
Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. You called my name. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you are my healing. Now your love is the heaven I'm breathing. I have a future. Go ahead and, and take a seat for just a moment or two. I want to invite Becca White, who is our youth director, uh, up to the platform. So today is our graduate recognition Sunday, and uh, she's going to help recognize our graduates and tell you guys what's going on with them. Good morning. So today, as Pastor Luke said, we have the wonderful opportunity to uh, recognize our graduates from high school, college, and grad school that are among us. So we have a video we'll show um, just to show all of them and the wonderful things that God's calling them into next. Um, but I also just wanted to take a second to encourage all of you, just as, as their church family, that we have a couple ways we can support them in this next season, and that's just a great gift of, of this church body. We can just continue to congratulate them as you see them, um, but also just be praying for them in this next season. Whatever they're going into, it might involve a new adventure or some kind of move, and we, just, um, we can surround them and just continue to be their church family even in a new season. So that's, that's one encouragement, and just to be praying and praying and praying. Um, but also, a cool opportunity is coming up this week at Dallas Town High School, one of our local school districts. Um, and I would like to invite all of you to their baccalaureate service. So it's a religious service held in the school auditorium, which is cool, where we can um, send off those seniors um, just with prayer and blessing, and it's wonderful to have all of the local churches to support that. So come support our own Dallas Town seniors, but all of the seniors um, just as the family of God, and that's coming up this Wednesday at 6 p.m. at Dallas Town High School's auditorium, and I'd encourage you to come to that. Um, but let's see this video and uh, then pray over our graduates.
at the hand. And I'd like to ask John to come forward, one of our grads who's here today. If anyone else is here too that I don't see, come on up. Um, and also, Chris, Max, Tom, Lucy, if you guys, any friends or family that want to come around, we're just going to lay a hand. And church, you can extend a hand. I just want to pray for John and for all of our graduates here. Here you go, guys. Wonderful. Let's extend a hand and let's bow our heads. God, we just thank you for um, the gift of this church community. We thank you for um, just the family we get to be part of through um, just our faith in you. And we pray now uh, for John. We thank you for your faithfulness in his life. We thank you that he's part of our church. And we just thank you for um, all the ways that you've brought him right here where he is today. So uh, we just pray for him and we pray for all of our graduates, God. We thank you for your faithfulness in their life. We thank you for all the ways you've provided for them in big and small ways uh, to bring them to this point, and we thank you for just the callings that you've put on their lives as followers of you, um, but just also the unique callings that they're going into, the ways that they're going to uh, share your love and to pursue you in other, um, just all kinds of areas in our community, in our world, so we just thank you for that, God, and we praise you. We pray that you'd go before them in this next season, that you'd be leading them and guiding them, and that you'd also be guiding us as a church, showing us how to support them and love them well, and to just surround them, um, just again showing them your love and continuing to pour into them even in a new season. So we thank you, God. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we love all of our graduates. I'll say something in particular about John, though. So I've known John since he was going into high school as a freshman, and it's been so much fun to see him grow and develop and change over these years. And you may have seen uh, that he's going to be a diesel mechanic. And I just want to say, and I mean this in the best possible way, John, you look like a diesel mechanic, dude. Like, <laughs> if you want somebody sliding under your truck to work on it, do you want somebody that looks like him or you want somebody that looks like me? He's the guy you trust, right? So, so John, you're on the right track. We love you, buddy, and we're so proud of you. Um, and as you see our graduates, please, you know, say congratulations to them and um, give them and maybe even pray with them in the days ahead as they make this transition. So let's stand. Um, we're going to continue our time of worship and uh, talk about the, the firm foundation that God gives us in Christ uh, that we build our lives upon, graduate or not. So let's continue our time of worship this morning. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down.
creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing his evidence his name would burst from sea and sky from rivers to the mountain tops
We invite you to be seated as we continue our time of worship together. Kids sixth grade and under are welcome to go downstairs for the kids' activities at this time. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 through 30. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who, subject, who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have been the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the, peer, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And thus he predestined, he also called those he called, he also justified those he justified, he also glorified. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Jane. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for uh, gathering us here once again, and we thank you so much for the opportunity to open your word, to explore its contents, and to talk about what it means together as we follow after you. We pray, Lord, that the time ahead uh, would increase our love for you, would increase uh, our faithfulness to you, and would help us to come to an even greater uh, appreciation of who you are, how you go to work in our lives, and how we might be more faithful followers. And so, Lord, um, just be with us. Give us your Holy Spirit in the moments ahead that we might hear your voice, um, that we might accept and embrace what you teach us, and uh, that we at the end of all things, Lord, might be known for our love for one another and for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so, um, about 10 years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to go to uh, a missional outreach in Florida um, with a church that was from Fort Lauderdale uh, called Calvary Chapel Fort Lauderdale. And it was a really interesting church, really, really great people. I uh, enjoyed hanging out with them and meeting them. But just to give you a little bit of a picture of what kind of church Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale is, um, we had kind of our pre-trip meeting uh, in the restaurant at the church. Not in a meeting room, not in the cafe that a lot of churches have, um, in the church's restaurant, like with waiters and waitresses and open to the public. And, and I'd just never seen that before, right? Like a church with a full scale, like restaurant. So this was a big place, a lot of resources um, and uh, really, really great ministry. And as we were kind of getting ready to go out and do this outreach, one of their pastors from their staff came and spoke to us. Um, I think he was one of like 400 
pastors on staff uh, because they're just, again, huge church. But this guy's name uh, was Joel, uh, Joel Sonnenberg, and he is a really, really interesting guy. Um, and I didn't know who he was prior to this. I just met him that day. But what made, part of what makes Joel so interesting as a person is that he has a really, really strong testimony. But the thing about that is that he can't really hide his testimony. Um, and so you can see it, you at least know part of the story almost right away when you see him walk in the room. He's got a lovely faith, um, loves Jesus a ton, has served God for his entire life. Um, he was born in the late 1970s, but the thing that makes his testimony so compelling is how he looks, uh, quite frankly. Um, so he was in a car accident when he was just 22 months old in the late 1970s, and um, his whole family, uh, thankfully his parents survived, but in the, the car accident, um, there was a fire, and it burned almost 90% of his body. Um, and so this is a picture of, of Joel now, um, and this is what he looked like when I met him. Um, and he's just got a really, really fascinating story, great testimony to faith, like I said. And so rather than kind of tell his story for him, um, we're going to show a couple of clips from this video throughout the message, but uh, just let him tell kind of his story and what it's been like for him um, over the past, you know, uh, 50 years. I was burned in a car accident when I was 22 months old. Uh, my, first, my family was on the first vacation we'd ever been on as a family. And we were stopped at the toll booth and a truck, a huge semi, hit the line of cars that we were in as we were stopped at the toll booth paying our toll. Um, it was about a seven car accident. I was the worst one injured in the accident. I was burned over 88% of my body, lost all my fingers, um, lost all but one toe, and um, doctors gave me a 10% chance at living. Um, to the power of prayer and the skilled hands of the doctors, God working through the skilled hands of the doctors. Um, after four and a half months of fighting for my life, I died. No, I didn't die, I, I lived. Um, I, I survived and I was finally released to go home. Um, but, and, the, and usually this is the point in the story where a lot of people breathe a sigh of relief, you know, they went to Disney World, that kind of thing. Um, but really, uh, this is where my real memory picks up. I came home from the hospital and my life was full of bandages and dressings and pain and physical and emotional pain. My life was full of anger and rage. But my, my parents really pushed me to get out of my comfort zone. They would put me in a mall when I was very young and they would tell me to say hi to everybody that passed by and smile. They wanted me as a young child to face head on uh, what will become more of a norm in my life. It wasn't until I received Jesus, did I see that as an opportunity? His story a little later in the message. Um, but when we hear stories like that, right, I mean, these people stand out as remarkable, do they not? Um, people who uh, not only go through um, just these earth-shattering, life-changing, um, ungodly kinds of circumstances, um, but then co uh, come out not only um, intact, but with a positive attitude, right, and, and joy and happiness, um, and most importantly, like an intact faith, right? And so, so you look at his story, and you think, wow, it's, he's a remarkable person. That is a really unique kind of story, and it's why it's stuck with me for over 10 years, right? Um, but as you think about what he has been through, um, there are certain elements to it that, that are extremely unique, extremely rare. The challenges that he faced are far beyond what a lot of us will face in our lives, but the interesting thing is, is that when you dig a little bit deeper, um, even though the specific circumstances that he faced are much different than what we will, um, the truth is, is that there is a kind of a universal piece to that story as well. Um, that, that every single one of us at some point or another is going to face some kind of extraordinarily difficult circumstance that we did not uh, plan on. Right? Sometimes it's a disease, it's an illness we go through. Sometimes it's a sudden death in our family that we don't expect, um, a marriage that falls apart, 
financial difficulties, you know, joblessness, whatever it might be, we all at some point or another find ourselves navigating um, these, these waters that we never thought we would face. And so obviously, you know, his story is remarkable because of, in large part, the physical suffering he went through and the physical appearance um, that he has now and all of the things that that meant for him growing up socially and spiritually and all those different elements to it. But the truth is, is that what happened to him um, when you dig down a little bit deeper is not the remarkable part of the story. Um, we all are going to face something in our lives that throws us for a loop and disrupts everything that we thought we knew. Uh, the remarkable thing about his story is not necessarily what he went through, but his response. Right? That's what stands out. The way that he handled what he experienced as a young child and growing up, his response is really the thing that makes his story worth telling. Because every single one of us, we could look at his story and he talks about feeling rage and anger and bitterness right? as he was growing up. And every single one of us would look at what he went through and if he would have just stayed in that place and stayed angry and resentful and bitter and rage-filled, we would go... I get it, right? Like, I kind of understand why you would stay in that place. I mean, let's be honest, like, I'm a little bit of a wuss when it comes to this kind of stuff, and so I get a hangnail, and I think God has forsaken me, you know? But instead of responding in that way, like, Joel chose a very different kind of response, one that, that not only kept him in love with God and increased his love for God, kept his faith intact, but one that actually, as we'll see later, ends up in a place where he is serving other people um, and blessing others, particularly because of what he went through. And the way that he responded to his circumstances and the way that he responded to this hand that he had been dealt in life says a lot about his theology, Right? It says a lot about how he thinks God works in the world. And the thing about today is that we are invited um, to, to see God and to see his work in a similar light, um, to embrace the same kind of philosophy that Joel did for his life when we face those circumstances. So we're going to finish this story a little bit later, uh, and you're going to see kind of how that worked out for him. But um, if you haven't been here in a while, or this is your first time here, uh, you, what you should know is that we've been working our way through the book of Genesis. This is part of a larger um, kind of initiative that we're doing, working through the Bible front to back. So we started in Genesis 1 just a couple months ago. We're going to end at the end of the book of Revelation um, somewhere <laughs> down the line. Uh, it's so long, I won't tell you when that will be. Um, but we're working through the Bible front to back uh, to help everybody see kind of how the different pieces of Scripture fit together and how all pieces of scripture point to Jesus. And so as we've walked through the book of Genesis over these past few weeks, we've looked at some of the foundational truths um, that Genesis presents to us that is important for our understanding of the Bible, but uh, more importantly than that, is important for how we understand our lives and, um, and how um, you know, we can have a relationship with God. And so, for example, Genesis chapter 1, we looked at how God created the world. Um, he, there we have a creator. He is intimately involved with it. He loves his creation. We looked at Genesis 3 and how sin entered into the world and broke everything. Um, and because we turned our back on God in rebellion, that's why we see the world as it is. And then from there, what we've seen God do is launch a rescue mission. Um, that he has entered into uh, creation through this one family that becomes known as the nation of Israel, and that through them he wants to redeem and reconcile and rescue the whole world, which culminates in the person of Jesus. And so that's where we've been over the past few weeks, looking at some of those foundational things that we all need to know. But one of the things that we haven't talked about um, really is how does God plan to do that? Right? What, what is God's strategy going to be as we read through the rest of the pages of the Bible? And even as we think about our own lives, how is God going to go to work in the world around us? And so we can ask this question, right? Like, how will God choose to go to work in this broken world in which we find ourselves? Because he's launched that rescue plan, as we mentioned. But the problem is, is that even the family that he chose for that rescue mission is flawed. They're all sinful, right? They all have issues and problems. The world in which they're operating is broken and flawed. Creation is still scarred by sin. And so the question is, okay, how is God going to go to work in that place to bring about the fulfillment of his plan in a world that is so deeply, still so deeply impacted by sin? And so the story that we're going to look at today is going to do is it's not only going to answer this question for us and give us a picture of that, 
but it's going to give us a little bit of a vision for how we can respond to the circumstances we face in the midst of this broken world. When we come face to face with that brokenness that God is uh, trying to address and address through Jesus, um, what can you and I do in response? And the way we're going to look uh, at that question is through a story that a lot of us have probably read through or know like little pieces of, and it's the story of Joseph. Now, I don't mean um, like Jesus' adopted dad, Joseph, right? He's New Testament. Um, talking about Genesis, Joseph. How many of you have ever heard any stories from Joseph's life before? Anybody a musical fan? Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, right? Like Andrew Lloyd Webber would be proud. Um, and so we kind of know little bits and pieces of this story, but what we're going to do um, is we are going to do a bit of a survey of Joseph's life, and we're going to talk about um, how his life demonstrates to us the answer to this question. How is God and how has God been at work in the world around us? So let's talk Joseph for a couple minutes. Um, Joseph, as a lot of us know, was part of that chosen family that God chose to bless the world. Um, and we started a few weeks ago talking about this story and talking about this lineage. Um, and so we started with Abraham. Remember, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob and who? Anybody remember? Jacob and Esau, right? Now we'll leave Esau out of this for, for uh, this moment just because we're talking about Jacob's descendants. But you can see uh, they're continuing on the family line, they're being fruitful, they're multiplying, and Jacob in particular does a really good job of multiplying. Um, he ends up with 13 children, uh, 12 of whom are boys. So you can imagine what that house was like, right? Um, and so these are the names of the 12 sons of Jacob. These become the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, and so you can see Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naph Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And I really like this list, um, as I feel like there are some names that just don't fit, right? Like if you were introducing these kids, you'd be like, oh yeah, this is Zebulun, and uh, this is Naphtali, and this is Reuben, and this is Issachar, and this is um, Ben, Dan, and Joe, <laughs> right? Like just very different. Um, but if you look at this family, what we see, as is the case with uh, all the families in the Old Testament, pretty much, um, they're a little bit dysfunctional. Because Jacob, and remember this is the same Jacob who was the trickster who stole the birthright from his brother, right? This is the same Jacob. Um, Jacob is not a great dad in some ways, and one of those ways is because in particular he likes to play favorites amongst his kids. Um, and in particular, his favorite is Joseph. Now, those of you that are parents, um, those of you that have more than one child, let's just talk about the open secret. Uh, you have a favorite. You're not supposed to talk about it. They're not supposed to know who it is, right? But you have a favorite child. But the problems enter in, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I think it's true. Um, but the problems enter in, right, when they can tell who the favorite child is. That's usually when the conflict starts to arise. And Joseph is not very good, and I don't think he cares at all, or Jacob, rather, is not very good, and I don't think he cares at all about hiding who his favorite is. Because from day one, Joseph is Jacob's favorite son out of the 12. And we know that for a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, the Bible tells us that directly. We're going to see it in a second. But what is the gift that signifies that Joseph is Jacob's favorite? The coat, right? It's, it's the coat that he gets, the coat of many colors, right? And so here's what we read in Genesis 31. It says, Israel, um, remember that is Jacob's new name after the story we read a few weeks ago. Uh, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. So he gives him, and the other 11 are left out. I don't know what color they were wearing, probably brown. Um, but he has this cool-looking ornate coat. But as we can tell, as we can predict, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Right? And so some of us know where this story is headed. We know what is going to happen. But the other part of this is that in the midst of this favoritism, um, Joseph is a little bit of a spoiled brat as well. Right? So he's taken all of this favoritism he's gotten from his father, and he's taken it to heart. He's also had these dreams where he sees his brothers and his father actually bow down to him. 
Um, and it, they're true dreams, they're prophetic dreams that God has given him. But just pro tip, right? If you've got brothers, you've got family members, and you have that kind of dream, just don't share it, right? Because especially in a situation like this where there's so much rivalry, like it's not going to go well, it's not going to help the relationship. And so when we enter into the story here, um, Joseph and his brothers already have this rivalry. They're already started to turn against him, and then the coat thing happens. And they, they just legitimately hate their brother Joseph at this point. So one day, all the brothers except for Joseph are out tending the flocks, and they see Joseph out in the distance coming their way. And as he gets near to them, they hatch a scheme, and they're like, we're going to solve this once and for all. So they decide that they're going to kill him. But Reuben, who is the more reasonable one, or the most reasonable out of them, says, no, 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 like, we, we can't kill him, he's our brother, that seems a little harsh, so let's do this, let's teach him a lesson, let's, let's beat him up a little bit. So they jump Joseph, and they beat him up, and they kick him down a cistern. And a cistern, um, in the ancient world, was a place where you would draw water from, it would collect rainwater, kind of like a well, but just for rainwater. It would have looked something like this. Right, so deep hole, too deep for Joseph to get out on his own. And so they beat him up pretty good, and they kick him down there, and he's stuck. And as they do, um, they kick him down there, and they go, all right, let's go have lunch. And so they go, and as they're eating, they're talking about what to do with Joseph. And so they say, man, if we leave him there, he's just going to die. He's going to die of thirst. He's going to die of exposure. We didn't want to kill him, so what do we do? And just in that moment come this group of merchants um, they're called Ishmaelites in the story, uh, and they're slavers, so they're slave traders. And they decide, we're going to sell our brother. So the, the slavers come, they sell Joseph to them, they take Joseph's coat, they dip it in some goat's blood, they bring it back to Jacob, and they convince Jacob that Joseph has been torn apart by animals and is dead. And so Jacob, uh, from this point on, for the next about 20 years or so, um, believes that Joseph has died. They've just sold their brother into slavery, and then the slavers take Joseph to Egypt, where he's sold again, and he becomes uh, a member of Potiphar's house. Potiphar is a uh, Roman, or a, uh, sorry, an Egyptian uh, official, a very important guy. And so it's at this point in the story, right, that for the first time, Joseph faces a choice. How is he going to respond to what he's just been through, right? And what, as a part of, and a member of this family that has been chosen to bless the world, how does his faith come into play in this particular situation? Because if you think about it, he's just gone from this favored, wealthy child with a great future ahead of him and all these dreams to being betrayed by his brothers, beaten up, um, kicked down a well, and then sold not once but twice, and now finds himself in the foreign land of Egypt where he doesn't know anyone as a slave. And so I stop to wonder, how would I respond in a situation like that? Right, that much bad luck, um, that many bad hands dealt to me, that many turns that I did not expect what would I do? Um, maybe you could ask yourself, what would you do? Because like I said, like I go on vacation and it rains and I question God's goodness. Right? I'm not very tough when it comes to these things. And so Joseph has had these horrible turns of events, things he never could have seen. And so Joseph has to really wrestle with his identity in these moments and how is he going to respond. But the thing that we see over and over again in Joseph's life, and this becomes a really prominent part of the story, is that he responds out of a certain posture and a certain belief over and over again. That he believes something to be true, he knows something to be true, that shapes his response to these circumstances, and it's this. Joseph believes and Joseph knows that God is with him. Remember, he's part of this family of promise, the numerous stars, the descendants, bless, go out and bless the world as God blesses you. And what Joseph believes as a member of that family is that no matter what happens to him, somehow, somewhere, even in ways that maybe he can't see, God is still at work. In the midst of his circumstances, God is going to go to work somehow. And so in this moment, in this very first moment where he has this choice, he could go down the path of bitterness and anger and resentment and all the things that all of us, myself included, would be tempted to go towards. But instead, he is shaped by this belief. God is with me. He is at work somehow. And I might see that someday and see how he's been at work during this time. 
But what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang on to this vocation I've been called to. I'm going to hang on to this calling that I have to be a blessing to the world, and I'm just going to do that right where I am. And so this is what we read. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, right? So it's apparent and evident to everybody else around that something is different about this guy. The Lord gave him success in everything that he did, and Joseph found favor in the eyes of Potiphar and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of the entire household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And so we see um, uh, Joseph embrace this vocation, continue to go about the work he's called to, and because of that, he sees this blessing, and he starts to ascend, right? Up out of the pit, he starts to rise to a place of prominence in Potiphar's house. And we would think, right, that if God was really with him, then he wouldn't be in Potiphar's house in the first place, right? He wouldn't be a slave in the first place. That's usually how we think. But what we see is that somehow God is with him even in these circumstances. And so things are looking up for Joseph. But unfortunately, um, as much as Potiphar noticed Joseph's work, Potiphar's wife notices something else about Joseph. Uh, in particular, that he is, as the, the Bible says, he is handsome and well-built, Right? And so she starts up a little thing for Joseph. She calls him into uh, her, her home, her room at one point, and uh, she propositions him and invites him to sleep with her. Now, he was a slave, remind you, and so he really didn't have a choice in this matter, but he still rejects her. And he says, no, 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 like your husband has been too good to me. He's been giving me so much uh, authority. Like I can't go through with this. So he uh, tries to remove himself from the situation and runs out, and she grabs onto his coat. This is not the Technicolor coat anymore. He doesn't have that. It's a different coat. But she grabs onto his cloak and pulls it off of him as he runs, and then she goes out in public and waves his cloak around and says, look, he tried to come after me. He tried to sexually assault me, and he was in my room, and this is proof, and we need to get rid of this guy. Really quickly, um, this particular story gave rise to what I think is one of the best couples costumes ever, um, and that is me and Becky. Um, so uh, it's anachronistic because it's not the right coat, but uh, we were at the, uh, the Fulton Theater, um, which is over in Lancaster, and you can rent costumes uh, at Halloween. This was, I think, like 2017, and we saw the Egyptian costume, and we saw the Joseph costume, and we said, We've got a story for that. Um, so that was, our, that was our costume. Yeah, I was thinking about growing my hair out like that. Um, I think it would be a good look. So Joseph, again, finds himself in this twist of fate, right? Things are going so well in Potiphar's home, but then all of a sudden he gets falsely accused, right, of something he did not do, and it angers Potiphar. Um, he buys his wife's story. Everybody else does as well. And so Joseph is arrested, and he's thrown into prison. And so again, he faces this question, how am I going to respond in this moment? But we see again this unwavering faith and trust in God. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Joseph knows that to be true and showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And so you see, right, the story repeating itself. The same thing that happened in Potiphar's house help, happens here in prison. He gets even more responsibility over those who were in prison. One day when Joseph is in prison, um, because he is continuing to hold on to this hope that he has and continuing to hold on to this vocation that he has, um, he's paying attention, right? He hasn't sunken into depression or disengagement. He believes God is at work, and he overhears a conversation between two men who are talking about a dream that they had. These two guys are part of uh, the Pharaoh's court, and he tells them, he says, I will interpret your dream for you if, when that dream comes true, you tell Pharaoh about me. And you tell him I'm here wrongly accused, and maybe he'll do something about it. So they agree to those terms. Joseph interprets the dreams for them, um, and he tells the one guy that in three days he's going to get out of prison, and he's going to be lifted high and elevated in the Pharaoh's court, and that a lot of things are going to go well for him. That's exactly what happens. The guy gets out of prison. He goes to Pharaoh. He's exalted and lifted up as the Pharaoh's cupbearer. And he tells the Pharaoh about Joseph, and he's let out of prison immediately. No. <laughs> Those of you that know the story, that is not how it goes. In another twist that goes against poor Joseph, this is what happens. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. 
And at this point, it's like, you got to be kidding me, right? Like everything continues to go against this poor guy. And we would think, if this is what it looks like for God to be with Joseph, maybe God should go be with somebody else, right? Like that might be good. Two whole years go by that he's forgotten. One day, uh, this same cupbearer is talking to Pharaoh. Turns out Pharaoh had a dream himself, and he's looking for an interpreter. Um, the guy who had been in prison with Joseph goes, I know somebody actually that can interpret that for you. I imagine him with like the, oh my gosh, I left the stove on moment where he was like, oh, I know there was something I was supposed to do two years ago when I got out of prison. Oh, that's right, um, Joseph, right? So he goes back, turns out Joseph is still there. So he pulls Joseph out of prison, brings him to Pharaoh, and Joseph says, I will interpret your dream for you, but I can't do it on my own, but God will do it for me and give you the answer. So God is still at work. Joseph knows that he is. Turns out the dream is about two distinct seven-year seasons. Um, one is a time where the, the crop and the harvest is going to be bountiful and plentiful and way more than they need. The second seven years is going to be a famine, though. And so Joseph says, you need to prepare for this famine. Get as much grain stored up as you possibly can, because those seven years are going to be rough. The Pharaoh is impressed by his interpretation. He says, we can't find anybody like this guy in whom the spirit of God is, right? So he recognizes, again, God is with Joseph. And then he says to him, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. And he puts Joseph in charge of overseeing everything during this seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And he says, you're going to be responsible for distributing all the food during this time because you are wise enough to do this. There's one more test that comes Joseph's way. The famine comes. There's no food in the whole region, Egypt, Canaan, anywhere. And who comes walking down the path to Egypt for food? Anybody know? His brothers. The brothers that he has not seen in 20 plus years, right? This whole story is condensed for us. Like it, it happens very quickly as we read it. But this was more than two decades. He was 17 when they sold him into slavery. He's now 40 years old. And so they show up and they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And it's at this point that having been through all that he was through, we would think this is Joseph's perfect opportunity for revenge. Right? If he would have dwelled on the bitterness and the anger and the resentment for all of those years, this is his moment to get back at them. He could deny them food. He could have them in prison. He could have them killed. Right? He could do anything he wanted to these guys. And so he hatches this plan to try to get at their hearts. And we don't have time to talk about it. I was lamenting to Becky this morning. I was like, ah, I love this story too much. Um, but, but he hatches this plan to see if his brothers have changed at all. Turns out they have. And so rather than hurt them, kill them, send them away, um, he works this plan, and eventually, not only does he feed them, um, but he reconciles with them. He forgives them, and he reunites with Jacob as well. And in the seminal moment of the story, Jacob has just died, so their father is gone, and his brothers think, if he's going to take revenge on us, it's going to be in this moment, right? There's nothing holding his power in check because dad is gone. And this is what happens. They're afraid he's going to kill him, and he says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And it's in this moment that we see, right? How does God go to work in this broken world? God goes to work in this broken world by doing just this, taking what is intended for harm and intended for evil, right? And using it and twisting it, overpowering it, reconciling it and changing it for good. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. And what I love about this is that it names evil for evil, Right? It doesn't gloss over it, where it says um, that you intended to harm me. The Hebrew word there is the word for evil. And so it says, like, listen, evil was done to me. People lied, people sold me out, people beat me up, right? This has been a long, hard journey. But God has taken all of the ups and downs and catastrophes and all of the things that tried to break me along the way, and he has used them for good. 
I believed all along that God was at work, even when I couldn't see it. And now, in this moment, I can see why I never gave up my vocational call to bless people around me, because this is why it all happened. So that I could be in this spot at this time to help these people through this famine. And he saves the lives of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And he knows that had he not been betrayed and sold out and enslaved and imprisoned, he couldn't be there in that moment. And so he saw how God works through all of those things to bring about this blessing. And so we come back to this question, right? How will God choose to go to work in this broken world? And the answer is here, right? God goes to work when God's people choose God's way in ungodly circumstances, right? Joseph found himself in all kinds of ungodly moments, things that we would never wish on our worst enemy, But rather than embrace bitterness and resentment and hatred and anger and violence and inflict pain on the people that that, that had hurt him, what he believed was that God was with him, God was at work, and that somehow God was going to take what was intended for evil and turn it for the good, either for himself or somebody else. And so he continued down that road, following the vocation that had been given to his family by God to bless the world. When God's People choose God's way in ungodly circumstances. That's when God goes to work. And so here's how this works, right? This works on two levels. There's kind of the meta level and then like the personal level. The meta level of this is that this this points us towards Jesus, doesn't it? Right, because if you think about who Jesus is, um, he was God's people. Like he was God's person more than anybody else. He was the culmination of all of Israel. Um, He chose God's way every single moment, perfectly faithful to God his entire life, perfectly faithful to the Father. And yet it was through the ungodly circumstances that Jesus found himself in, arrested, betrayed, beaten, crucified, dead, that God did his greatest work that that sacrifice and that violence that was done to him becomes the redemption for our sins, and that in raising him from the grave, God invites us into new life. And so, so Jesus is, right, he is the true and better Joseph. He is all of this in one person. He is this come to life. But on the personal level, right, what we have to realize is that every single one of us is going to face, either is facing now or will in the future, some kind of circumstance that is going to be so hard to overcome, we don't know how we're going to do it. And we have the ability, we have the opportunity to respond like Joseph, to not go towards the path of anger and bitterness and resentment, but to remember the vocation that God has given us. Love one another, make disciples of Jesus Christ, bless the world around us. In Invite God to go to work in that. And so to close out, um, to finish this message, I know it's going a little long, um, I want to show you the end of Joel's story. I want to show you what it, what it looks like now because it paints a beautiful picture of this exact thing of how God reconciles even evil to his way. I grew up in a very, very small town in North Carolina called Montreat, North Carolina. It was a really uh, wonderful place. I was able to excel in sports. I was able to excel in school. I went to seminary. I became an itinerant speaker around the world, literally. Um, I wrote a book, um, traveled everywhere. And one of the places that I traveled was here to Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale. I met up with Pastor Bob. God took over in our meeting and one thing led to another and there was a opportunity for me to come down here so it was a natural fit that i started working with king's kids people with special needs we've grown to probably 200 families about 60 of which come on a week to week basis we teach them god's word you know god's word says it never returns void So it doesn't say, oh yeah, and it returns void with kids with special needs. No, it says it never returns void. So our job is to keep the kids safe and to teach them God's word. There isn't a day that goes by. I grew up in a very, very small town in North Carolina called Montreat, North Carolina. It was a really uh, wonderful place. I was able to excel in sports. I was able to excel in school. And 
And one of the places that I traveled was here to Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale. I met up with Pastor Bob. God took over in our meeting and one thing led to another and there was a opportunity for me to come down here. So it was a natural fit that I started working with King's Kids, people with special needs. We've grown to probably 200 families, about 60 of which come on a week to week basis. We teach them God's word. You know, God's word says it never returns void. So it doesn't say, oh yeah, and it returns void with kids with special needs. No, it says it never returns void. So our job is to keep the kids safe and to teach them God's word. You know, there isn't a day that goes by uh, during church service that I don't meet, meet a kid that goes, what happened to you? And I go, I was burned in a car accident with a lot of fire and God saved me. How cool is that? There are real things out in life that you have to confront and that you have to deal with. And the great thing is God can help you through those things. He can carry you through those things. The Lord in his divine, um, in his divine nature um, doesn't create accidents. He um, plans and purposes all things to work for good for those that love him. Joel was like Joseph, right? Um, he didn't choose what happened to him. Um, he was dealt a particular hand that was out of his control, but rather um, than going down the road that so many of us, and myself included, might go down, he chose the way of joy and peace and loving Jesus that led then to a place of purpose where he could use what he's been through to bless others. And so I don't know what circumstance you're facing or what you will face, but down the road you will face that same choice that Joseph did. Whatever it is that betrays you, kicks you to the bottom of a cistern, or puts you in jail of some kind, right? If you are facing that choice, you can go either direction. The invitation is to trust in the true and better Joseph, knowing that all things work together for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. For those who love Jesus and are reconciled to God, we can see him go to work through any and all circumstances. We may not see how it ends. We may not see the culmination and the redemption with our own eyes like Joseph did, but we have the promise that God is with us and he will go about that work if we trust him. Let's pray. And worship team, you can come. Heavenly Father, um, we are just so grateful for uh, stories like Joel's that inspire us and stories like Joseph's uh, that show us through your word the truth of who you are. That in the deepest, darkest moments of our lives and the most challenging circumstances, God, even though sometimes we can't see it, we know you are still at work. And so, Lord, help us by faith to live with courage. Help us to live with conviction that this is true. That because of what Jesus has done for us, all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to your purpose. Help us to trust that every day, Lord. Help us to look for that redemption. And when we don't see it, Lord, um, may we be part of the Hebrews 11 Hall of Fame who keep the faith even when we don't have the eyes to see it. And so, Lord... Uh, help us to do this in the week ahead. Regardless of what we face, may this be our posture before you. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as we go to close our time of worship, we're going to go right to um, just our, our final song together. So I'm going to invite you to stand. Um, and we're going to sing about this promise. Uh, that God so loved the world that he set about on this rescue mission uh, to reconcile all things to himself through all things.
So this week, may you go in peace, live by faith, and remember that regardless of what you are facing, God is with you. And if you trust in him through the true and better Joseph, then all things, even bad things, will be reconciled unto God and will work for your good and the benefit of those around you. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.